Thank you, Andrea. Indeed, the second lecture is an attempt to link uh, theories of um, ethnicity and nationalism with securitization theories with a specific focus on ethnicity regions. But I just want to dwell a bit more on the final slide. An important insight of um, identity studies, whether it's ethnic, religious, uh, or else. And that's the boundary-making uh, insight that goes back to Norwegian social anthropologist uh, Frederick Barth, um, which I uh, also refer to in Comparative Politics of Exclusion, and I carried it to the very title of the, uh, of the article, Boundary-Making uh, uh, boundary in Europe and the Americas Since Reformation. Frederick Barth's insight is that it's not the content of identities that matters, it's the boundary between them, right? So it's difficult to say, and it might not be very useful in many cases, what it means to be content-wise, Albanian and Greek, Romanian and Bulgarian, English and Welsh, you know, Serbian and German, and so on and so forth, rather than the boundary that separates the two groups. And I think I have an example that I use a lot in ethnicity and nationalism courses that I'd like to also share with you. Some of you might know, I don't know if there are, there's anyone who works on the Western Balkans or Albanians in particular. Yes, no? Okay. So Albanians, you know, the ethnic group, there's also a nation state, but also many ethnic Albanians beyond Albania. So over a millennium, right, among Albanians, there is a distinction between the Geg Albanians in the mountains and the Tosk Albanians in the plains. You can think of this as a sub-ethnic division. The Albanians of the plains, Tosk, the Albanians of the mountains, the Gegs, more, you know, warriors and, you know, slightly maybe different cultural features. Okay. It's a good example for boundary making. We are talking about pre-Christian times. And when Christianity came, Tosk became Byzantine Orthodox Christians. Geg became Roman Catholic. Right? So... They changed their religion, and yet they converted to different sects, which for many were different religions at the time, right? Orthodox Christianity versus Catholic. Then Ottomans came, and with Ottomans, Islam. A large majority of Albanians converted to Islam. But Geg, who were previously Catholic, converted to mainstream Sunni Islam. The Tosk in the plains converted to Bektashi, more uh, non-mainstream heterodox Islam. Wow. So now they changed yet another world religion, and yet they kept the sectarian difference by converting to more uh, Sunni versus non-Sunni Islam. And then communism came. Tosk 
became more ardent communist and Dev Hoxha, the infamous dictator of Albania, is a Tusk. So are many of the nomenclature of the Albanian Communist Party. So the Tusk of the Plains became more communist and more in the leadership. The gig in the mountains became more anti-communist, more resistance. 2,000 years, two major world religions, another cosmology, Marxist-Leninism is a quasi-religion, and yet you have the content changed radically from Catholicism to Sunni Islam to anti-communism from you know, Byzantine Orthodoxy to uh, Bektash Islam to communism, and yet the boundary remained the same. This is the fundamental insight of, I think, what I derive from Frederick Barth, that what matters is the boundary, not the content that it envelops. So the idea of toskness and deadness persisted despite multiple religious and irreligious conversions to different religions and ideologies and cosmologies like Marxism. I made the similar argument, if you ever read in the comparative politics of exclusion, that the exclusion of Jews and Muslims continued from early medieval period to the present day, but with very different justifications. Right? The medieval anti-Semitism was Jews as the god killers, they side. And then there was the racial anti-Semitism. Sang 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 um, the blood loss, Sangre de Limpieza. And then there was the accusation of Judeo-Bolshevism, Jews as Bolsheviks. So the accusation changed, whether it's religious, they side, whether it's racial, you know, blood loss, or whether it's ideological, Bolshevism. Same thing, actually, with Muslims, I mean, so first it was religious, then even Moriscos, the converted Muslims of Spain were expelled, so it became racial, even after they converted to Catholicism in Spain, the Moriscos. Later it became, you know, fundamentalism, anti-secularism, all kinds of other accusations. But basically the excluded remained the same, Jews, Muslims, but the justification and the mode the method of exclusion has changed. I think this is also follows up on the Gek Tosk example that the boundary making and the mechanism of exclusion is more important than what the content of the exclusion and what its justification is uh, for identity preservation, of course. And that truly concludes the first lecture. Uh, do you have any short questions as we have our Formula One rally into 70 slides, one minute each. No? I mean, I think the first part is more important, if you ask me, than empirical applications. Uh, what was your name? Yeah, Anna. Anna, yes. It's definitely relevant. In the end, all three regimes include and exclude some, which is basically the core argument of the second lecture. Uh, but each regime needs to first construct the political hegemony to become the status quo. But once the status quo changes, as I'm going to emphasize here, the defenders of the previous status quo become dissidents and opponents, right? So securitization is almost reversed, right? So, for example, advocates of mono-ethnic regime were pro-status quo and uh, the advocates of multi-ethnic or anti-ethnic reformists were securitized as dangerous, but once the regime shifts to assimilationist anti-ethnic, now those who want to bring back a mono-ethnic regime are probably securitized because they are now against the status quo. Uh, I don't know if this in any way answers your question, but I thought it was relevant. Uh, in terms of regime types, that's why inclusion of Soviet Union was a major leap uh, in my dissertation and book, but that's actually my primary um, field of qualification in PhD, because many argued that the 
electorally competitive Germany and Turkey, which has multi-party competitive tradition, might not be comparable to the Soviet case, which is a totalitarian dictatorship. But even in that totalitarian dictatorship, there were different factions within the nomenclature who had different visions of what is what Soviet Union should be vis-a-vis -vis ethnic diversity. So in a non-democratic regime, like a totalitarian dictatorship like People's Republic of China or uh, Soviet Union, uh, you can still look at the factions within the elite and how they seek to establish hegemony. Uh, so hopefully that will be more um, kind of uh, clearer uh, in the second segment. Thank you, uh, Anna. Uh, and this uh, section's readings are uh, the following. I, I think the first chapter of my book was shared, which summarizes um, everything, and it's very, very similar to the world politics article. And then an article that's almost entirely on Russia, uh, transforming nation through migration in Russia and Turkey, but uh, as you see in the article, most of it is on Russia. Then another article I co-authored with Sufyan Zemikov, a Circassian uh, academic, um, on the Circassian republics uh, in the North Caucasus and the elimination of Circassian languages, actually, uh, from uh, higher education. And then finally, an article just on Turkey, uh, looking at the period after my book, you know, after 2012, uh, One Nation Under Allah, Islamic Multiculturalism, Muslim Nationalism, and Turkey's reforms. And this is the roadmap of the lecture. The focus as Andre mentioned, to fit with the secular EU framework is securitization challenges that each ethnicity regime entails. Because this is something I try to make very clear that there is no perfect solution, right? No matter which ethnicity regime the state shifts to, there will be opponents and supporters. It's just uh, the mode of exclusion uh, and governance changes. The movement from mono-ethnic to anti-ethnic regime in Germany, the first 30 minutes, but we started slightly uh, later than scheduled. Uh, the movement from anti-ethnic towards multi-ethnic regime in Turkey or Turkey, now the official name of the country is Turkey in English, or Turkey in Italian, which is close to the Italian, uh, I guess, version. And that's the next 30 minutes, the second 30 minutes. And then the movement from multi-ethnic towards anti-ethnic assimilationist regime in Russia, which is most of the readings actually, in the last 30 minutes. I guess I'll try to do it 25 minutes to fit it into the schedule for each country. We can, um, we can or we can eat some of the lunch uh, without eating the lunch, okay. Not the entire lunch. Not the entire lunch, yes, I, I promise you that. Uh, every ethnicity regime has supporters and opponents, right? Um, yes, one minute per slide. Uh, but it's very, and this is important, and this is something that all nation states do share. And it was one of the quotes you saw yesterday from Anderson, which I also always use. National identity is inherently limited. It's important to contemplate why he defined it as such, limited and sovereign. It has to be as opposed to something else. As opposed to what? As opposed to unlimited. Because as you know, there are, I mean, national identity is inherently limited unlike some cosmopolitan identities, which may be ideological, Marxism-Leninism, imperial, Roman, Ottoman, religious, Christianity, Islam, that theoretically aspire to include the entire humanity, right? So universalistic religions and empires and ideologies, Marxism, Leninism, Islam, Christianity, etc., they are theoretically unlimited, right? They might include the entire humanity. Nationalism and national state, by definition, is inherently, essentially limited, and this is important, because it requires that you draw a boundary it's just how that boundary is drawn on an ethnic basis, multi-ethnic basis, religious, ideological basis, that differs, but there has to be exclusion, right? Uh, thus, some people are always excluded in any national configuration as opposed to a cosmopolitan configuration, and we don't have a cosmopolitan polity in the world today. I mean, there used to be, again, we can think of Romans and maybe Soviets, we can discuss it as aspirationally cosmopolitan, but there is no state in the world that is aspirationally cosmopolitan today. All of them are inherently limited by definition, by, you know, deliberately limited. So some people are always excluded. 
Similarly, all three ethnicity regimes have had opponents and supporters, but the key policies of contestation differ depending on the particular ethnic regime type. And this is a representation of that directly from the book. In the three countries we focus on in today's lecture and the book, had different ethnicity regimes, and therefore they had different dimensions of exclusion and different policies of contestation. Since the German regime was monoethnic until 1999, the major challenge came from the anti-ethnic dimension, not from multi-ethnic dimension. There was no demand for multiple official languages and federalism. There was a demand, and this makes sense, for citizenship and inclusion. That's an anti-ethnic demand, and the, those who demanded it were primarily foreign workers. Auslander, Gastarbeiter, Einwanderer, right? The words matter a lot in all three cases. Which word you use for the group? Is it Gastarbeiter, is it Auslander, foreigner, or is it Einwanderer, you know, an immigrant? And we'll see this also in the Russian and the Turkish case. Words are very important in the discursive battles. And the fourth line was membership, and the specific issue area of the first third of the book is then German citizenship. Not multiple official languages, not constitutional amendment, not ethnic minority status, citizenship. So the ethnic regime type, in a way, predetermines the key area of contestation. When you turn to Russia, the regime was multi-ethnic, but the challenge came from both those who felt discriminated by territorialized ethnicity, especially Soviet and then later Russian Jews and Germans, who got all the discrimination from having their ethnicity written, but no benefits, but also many ethnic Russians who thought the multi-ethnic regime benefited non-Russians. You know, it benefited Tatars and Chechens, so they wanted to get rid of it and move towards an assimilationist nation state. So the key fault line was obviously expression, and its first policy of contention, which I focus on the second, uh, the last third of the book, was uh, ethnicity in everybody's ID card, you know, whether to remove it or to keep it. So assimilationists wanted to remove it, pro multi-ethnics wanted to keep everybody's ethnicity, nationalnost, priatia puncta, the fifth point in the uh, ID card, there, which has been put there since the time of Stalin. And in the Turkish case, or Turkey, with the new official name of the country, uh, which is yet another transformation, I guess. The status quo was anti-ethnic assimilationist, so the main challenge came from Kurds and other linguistic minorities, as are Arab, as Georgian, and the key fault line of contestation was expression of this ethno-linguistic diversity, and specific issue area was the status of non-Turkish languages in broadcasting, education, and other spheres. So that's the summary. And now we can end. No, we need to focus on the examples. This is a picture I took in 2004 or 2007, 2007, I think. This is the facade of the Reichstag, uh, if you've been to Berlin, Dein Deutschen Falke, to the German people. The German citizenship law, the Staatsangehörigkeit Gesetz, dates back to 1913. That's imperial Germany, right? Even before the start of the war. And in its essence, it remained unchanged until 1999 in granting preferential citizenship to people who can demonstrate ethnic Germans. So it remained in place during Weimar, the National Socialist dictatorship, post-war Germany, and even nine years after unification. So it survived four different regimes. If you think nationality or ethnicity policy is contingent on regime type, think again, you know, from empire to Weimar, to national socialism, to post-war, to unification, five different regimes, arguably, but same citizenship law persisted. After Second World War, millions of non-ethnic German workers, many of them Italians, but even larger, Turks and uh, you know, Spaniards and Portuguese, moved to Germany by invitation. Uh, and they and their descendants have been living in Germany by now three or even more generations, but they could not become citizens. We are talking about millions of people. The numbers are in my book. On the other hand, millions of ethnic Germans who were living in former Soviet Union before that Russian Empire for hundreds of years, like the Volga Germans, many of which were um, deported to Kazakhstan, one million of them. Many other ethnic Germans in Romania, in Hermannstadt, right, in Czechoslovakia, in Poland, they could automatically acquire citizenship. More than two million such ethnic Germans acquired citizenship from former Soviet Union alone. At the same time, Germany was even buying ethnic Germans from Romania 
during the Cold War. Uh, it's in my book, but I think they were paying 5,600 Deutsche Mark for every ethnic German Romania allowed. So at the same time that Germany was paying money to import ethnic Germans from Romania and allowing millions of Russian ethnic Germans, the rate of naturalization remained below 1%, and Helmut Kohl, the Christian Democratic Chancellor who came to power in 1982 and remained in power for 16 years, his campaign slogan, one of the two key domestic goals in 1982 election, was to reduce the number of foreigners, by which he means these immigrants, the Turks, Italians, Yugoslav, by half. Mr. Zahir von Auslander, Hyberian. I'm going to half the number of the foreigners, right? And this was actually followed with a concrete policy proposal, Rukke Barachat package, the readiness to return package, which paid 10,500 German mark to any Turkish and other worker who permanently left Turkey, uh, who permanently left Germany, right? So if you put this together, Germany paying 5,600 mark to buy ethnic Germans from Romania, at the same time it's paying 10,500 German marks to any Turk or Italian or Yugoslav who permanently left Germany, and I think 2,000 mark extra for every child they took with them if they have children. This shows a very crystal clear mono-ethnic conception of uh, Germans. The state deliberately tried to equate reduce the non-ethnic German, increase the ethnic German, even with major financial packages and investments, even as late as 1980, coal government, yeah? And then, after 87 years, in 1999, SPD Green government changed the citizenship law of 1913 in 1999, which came into effect in 2000. Why and how did such an enormous change happen? You know the answer because I have the theory in the previous slide. So the other explanations don't work. I'm going to, I'm going to skip this. It's just a reminder. Germany didn't collapse. European Union didn't impose a new citizenship policy on Germany. It can't. I mean, European Union can't impose uh, French citizenship laws or French you know, ethnic policies. European Union can't impose anything on member states, if they are, especially if they are members. Uh, and it wasn't some kind of an international wave that swept Germany either. I think those are uh, very much unconvincing if you look at the chronology. Uh, the dynamics were almost entirely domestic, all three factors. And you know the three factors from the previous uh, lecture, uh, the theory of ethnic regime change. You needed counter elites, which are political representatives of constituencies with ethnically specific grievances. These were the leftists in Germany. First, the SPD. Why? Because immigrant workers, Gastarbeiter, by definition, were linked with the Labour Union, Deutsche Gewerkschaftbund, the German Labour Union, and the SPD, the Social Democratic Party. They didn't have organic linkages with the Christian Democrats, Christian Social Union, or even FDP, the, which was more business-oriented liberal party. So their linkage were almost exclusively through Labour Union, uh, and the Triebsrat, also the uh, factory councils, with the Social Democrats. So you needed a Social Democratic government, but it wasn't enough. Social Democrats were in government, as you'll see, for 13 years in the 70s, but no change happened. You also needed a new discourse, what it means to be German, versus what it means to be ethnically German, Italian, Turkish, you know, Croatian, etc. No one had that until at least the late 80s and early 90s. And you needed a government which had a political hegemony, not 51% majority in the Bundestag, more like almost two-thirds majority in the Bundestag in the German parliament, because the opposition to changing German citizenship law will go beyond the parliament, the bureaucracy, the etc. So, I mean, for those interested in political science methodology, this is clearly most different systems design, which is one of the best case designs for theory building, because Germany and Turkey and Soviet Union and Russia are very different in many respects. So if we can identify a similar theoretical sequence of change outcome in three very different polities, that's actually very good for the theory, because it means it's quite generalizable, right? 
if I picked, you know, Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco, or Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador, you know, countries that share many things in common, you could say, well, this theory might just be applicable to Spanish-speaking Northwest, South African, uh, South American countries, or just the Maghreb countries. But I picked three countries with very different religious, cultural, political, and other traditions and background. So if we find a theory that works in all three, that's actually very good for the theory which I think it is, but anyways. But within each case, it's more similar systems design, right? When we look at different periods of German history, it's the same country. So you look at 50s, 60s, 70s, so you just need to identify what changed in 19, by 1998, which wasn't there in the 80s, 70s, 60s, which explains uh, the change in the citizenship law after 90 years. I'm very grateful to all the members of the parliament and bureaucrats and civil society leaders, 30 of them in Germany and about 15 each in uh, Russia and Turkey. That has been a while, of course, in 2007. Some of them are no longer with us. Uh, they've died. And uh, some of them, uh, and all of them are very public figures, I mean, including even members in the uh, ministry. So the German interviews were the, it was easiest actually to access. Uh, political elites in Germany, which I'm very uh, 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 grateful. Uh, slightly less in the case of Russia. And it's, uh, okay, I'm gonna just, yeah. So, this is a visual representation. This is the previous German model, yes, 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 no, 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 pure mono-ethnic, but with this change, what happens is that the first one, ethnic priority in citizenship, is moving towards no, it's no, right? So one policy change, which doesn't mean Germany is no longer mono-ethnic and no, and no. It just means it's now a hybrid between mono-ethnic and anti-ethnic, because preferential immigration still continues. Spät out Siedler, still ethnic Germans can preferentially immigrate to Germany and get citizenship. So there is still a preferential quota for, let's say, the few remaining Kazakh Germans or Russian Germans. They can still get uh, preferential citizenship. So uh, ethnic priority in immigration continues. But within Germany, permanent resident Turks and Italians and Croats and Bosniaks, they are no longer prevented from acquiring German citizenship. So one key policy has changed. The others remain the same, but this itself is a major kind of change after 87 years. So let's go through each decade in about a slide or minute uh, so that we match our uh, scheduled time. 1949 is when post-war Germany was reconstituted as a, as a state, right? The Bundesrepublik Deutschland became independent uh, in 1949. 49, the West Germany, uh, and the first 20 years under Christian Democrats and Konrad Adenauer's chancellorship is a period where I wouldn't expect any change and there was absolutely no, you know, proposal for change. Because this is a period when a center-right government was in place. This was a period where, you know, Germany was defined as a Schicksalsgemeinschaft, a community of faith, where you had the Flucht, millions of ethnic Germans, uh, Fertribener, the, who were driven away from Eastern European lands like Poland and Czechoslovakia and Romania and Hungary. So there was actually heightened identification of ethnic Germanness and German national identity. In a way, 1945 is the period when Germany becomes most ethnic German, right? Not only that it's after the Holocaust, and that led to a certain level of ethno-religious homogenization, but you also had the inflow of millions of ethnic Germans who were driven away because they are ethnic German. So this is a period when ethno-national Germanness crystallizes in a way, and there's a center-right government in place which gets their vote. Right? So you don't have a leftist government who has uh, fundamental problems with uh, uh, a national identity conception that is essentially ethnic. GDR, or DDR, the German Democratic Republic, is a separate story, and that's not my story, but I did look at it, and it's fascinating. In the German Democratic Republic, you clearly see the shadow or kind of implication of the Marxist-Leninist Soviet policy. They codified the Serbian ethnic group, Serbishes, folk as a Serbian folk, like Deutsche folk, as a, as a nation. This didn't happen in the Federal Republic in the West. 
because what they were doing in East Germany was basically the application of the Soviet model of designating ethnic groups as nations with their institution, Domovina, the Serbian Linguistic Cultural Association, with specific you know, sites, Laos, it's, it's one of them. Uh, Cottbus is the other, where I interviewed uh, a representative of Domovina, the Serbian uh, Association in Brandenburg. But that was a different marxist leninist soviet influence story that is then, of course, absorbed into the West German st story with, uh, with uh, unification. So the mainstream, you know, the, what characterizes German this region is, of course, the story of West Germany as it evolved into unified Germany later. And that's where my primary uh, interest lies, because that's why you had millions of guest workers. First from Italy, the first major recruitment was from Italy, 1955, followed by Spain and Greece uh, in the late 50s, Turkey, which becomes the biggest recruitment in 1961, followed by Morocco, Tunisia, Portugal, and the final agreement with Yugoslavia in 1968. So all of a sudden, millions of non-Germans move into Germany as workers, and they permanently settle. How is it that they permanently settle, even though, for example, in the Turkish agreement, which got the most uh, workers, there was originally a rotation principle. All the workers would be sent back after two years to be replaced with new workers. Right? And counterfactually, if this rotation principle was implemented, you would never have permanent settlement of workers, right? But who demanded the discarding of the rotation principle? Who do you think? They never applied the rotation principle. They never sent Turks or others back in two years to get new workers. I mean, it's kind of commonsensical. Who do you think? Do you think the Turkish or whatever Italian workers agitated and they said we want to stay, you know, permanently? Who do you think got rid of the rotation principle? Anyone? Enterprise, right? Because no company, no business owner, no uh, employer wants to send back workers after they acquire language skills, you know, manual and you know uh, skills in the factory to be replaced by someone from you know Central East Anatolia or Sicily who doesn't speak German, who hasn't worked in the assembly line before every two years. So it's actually German business who did not want to implement the rotation principle. So in a way, we have the original cause of permanent settlement of millions of workers. It's the German businesses demand and uh, uh, need uh, to have them. So this, of course, creates the following issue. Workers organize in labor unions. This is the only way they can represent themselves. The Deutsche Gewerkschaft Bund is the umbrella union of unions. And there they have, because they are union members, and in many senses, they are more active union members than Germans, in, you know, uh, their life is defined by work. They are immigrant workers, right? They are guest workers or immigrant workers. It's a battle of terminology there uh, in identity politics. So they exert their representation and power through labor unions to SPD, right? The Social Democratic Party of Germany. So it's very clear from the beginning that the main political party that is most sympathetic and linked with the workers is the SPD. It's not. Christian Social Union, Christian Democrats, or FPD, uh, FDP, but uh, it's uh, the SPD. Already in the 60s, it's not this issue was always in the agenda, by the way. In, uh, already in 1968, there were riots in southwestern Germany, and the Bild had a headline, are uh, the foreigners more hardworking than Germans? You know, why are we recruiting uh, millions more? But anyway, so. As I said, there was a conservative government in place. 69-82 is a much more interesting period for the theoretical purposes as well. Because for 13 years, you had a social democratic government. First under Willy Brandt, and then under um, Schmidt. Yeah, Schmidt. Schmidt, which is not liked as much by the left and the immigrant workers, uh, Willy Brandt, who is seen as more liberal and open-minded. But it's 13 years of social democratic government. So you would think, or at least I would think, here you have several million people who, if they are naturalized, given citizenship and voting rights, they are going to vote left, right? That's going to bring several million votes to the Social Democratic Party. 
it could lead to an electoral hegemony, right? It's a politician's dream. <laughs> but in 13 years, there is absolutely no proposal or even discussion of amending the citizenship law. Even though these people now, they are having children and it's the second generation, there is no, uh, there is no attempt to change the ethnicity regime in the uh, 70s and 80s. And it's post-1968, right? It's the student protests, it's a new era in Western politics, etc. The reason, I argue, is because SPD or its smaller coalition partner, the liberal FDP, did not have a new discourse about what it means to be German without being ethnic German. They didn't have a new ideology. And I quote, I translated uh, quite a bit from the, uh, from the proceedings of the Bundestag. Uh, you can read it uh, if, if you haven't. And I have the German originals in the footnotes as well for those of you who read German. And then, for example, they convene a commission that brings together all the major parties, CDU, SPD, um, and the FDP, Bundlander Commission, the co uh, Commission of the Federation and the States in 1977, to deal with the foreigner's issue, Auslander flag, a foreigner's question or foreigner's problem. And what does the commission of federation and the states resolve. Its resolution is that Germany is not a country of immigration. Deutschland is kein Einwanderungsland. That's the first resolution. Foreign workers should be supported to go back. The foreign labor recruitment is stopped in 1974 with the 1973-74 with the global economic crisis. So there's the Anwerbe stop and it's kept. There is no more recruitment. But you have several million people settled and they have families and they are growing, they are not growing. So the Bundlander Commission of Social Democrats, Christian Democrats, Liberals and others, it concludes that Deutschland is kind of Anlander's land and the foreigners should be supported to go back to their country of origin and etc. It doesn't mean that there was nobody with an idea of reform. Hans Dietrich Genger, who later became foreign minister, a very high-ranking uh, liberal, FDP, and more importantly, and I focus on that and translate his report, Heinz Kuhn, who was the minister president, prime minister of nordrhein westfalen the largest German state, and the German state with the largest number of foreign workers, and a very liberal, or let's say, pro-immigrant uh, leader within the party. He has what is known as the Kuhn Memorandum, which he publishes in 79, which is kind of the opposite of the Bundlander Commission, but much less influential, not taken as the official policy line. But he's an important person, right? I'm the minister, it's the prime minister of the largest German state and a high-ranking social democrat, himself a labor union organizer earlier in life. He has a survey, and in the Kuhn Memorandum in 1979, he says these are not guest workers or foreigners, they are immigrants. They've permanently settled, we have a survey, most of them have no plan or ability to go back anyways, and they don't want to. So what we must do is to stop the Turkish language, Greek language, Italian language education. We need to teach them German, and we need to naturalize them, give them citizenship to expedite their integration. Uh, whereas at this time, they were teaching Turks, Turkish, Greeks, Greek, so that they are ready to go back to Greece and Turkey, right, and other places. But this is not taken as the, as the position. In fact, when the issue comes up in the Bundestag, Christian democratic opposition usually pushes uh, the government, the social democratic government, to reaffirm their agreement with the proposition that Germany is not a country of immigration. Okay, so I already mentioned all of this. Yeah, and there are such debates in 1980 and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I already mentioned this, so I'm not following my own slides. So the Kuhn Memorandum gives us the alternative path not taken, which shows that alternative path was very visible. We have the document there from 1979. So in many ways, what happens in 1999 with the citizenship reform is what Kuhn already proposed 20 years earlier. Again, counterfactual history. If it was done in 79, very different, you know, politics and society probably. But for my theory, it couldn't have happened because the social democratic and liberal leadership, just like the Christian democratic leadership, believe that Germany is not a country of immigration, being ethnic German is kind of necessary for being German national, uh, and without a new ideology, being in government did not uh, matter. What can a counter elite, like the social democrats, in government, without a new discourse, do? Without a new discourse or hegemony? Again, Germany is a wonderful example of that. 
Social Democrats did something for immigrant workers. They created new legal categories. They didn't, and they didn't even attempt to change citizenship reform, so they didn't expand membership of Germans, but they created, they passed a new foreigners law in 1978, and they issued um, in the first state of and an unlimited residence permit, uh, and of and hearts berechtigung, the right of residence permanently. And these numbers you see in my book, they skyrocket from several thousand to hundreds of thousands. So they couldn't and they didn't even attempt to give citizenship to foreign workers, but they basically gave them thousands, tens of thousands, eventually hundreds of thousands of unlimited residence permits. This is exactly what a government in power linked with a you know, constituency that has grievances against the quo can do without hegemony and without a new discourse. It's kind of particularistic benefits that don't change the definition of nationhood, in this case, Germans. And there were many opportunities, again, this goes to yesterday's, uh, I think, lectures, like there are objective crises that are in the Bundestag, discussed in the Bundestag and in the media at very high levels, that could have easily been solved with naturalization of immigrants or foreign workers, but they are deliberately not. For example, in the late 1970s, in 1977, Bundestag is again discussing German demographic decline. There aren't enough babies and German population will decline over the long term. This is a national kind of maybe not crisis or emergency, and a major concern, it's, it's uh, discussed in the parliament. And then the Christian Democratic opposition gives a question, Kleiner Anfraga, to the government. It says, are you thinking about neutralizing the Auslander, the foreign workers? The purpose of the question is not to say, yeah, yes, let's neutralize it. The purpose of the question is to make sure that the government says, no, absolutely not. And that's exactly what the government says. The government says, no, no, we are not thinking about neutralizing foreign workers or their families. We are going to solve the demographic problem by you know, supporting already uh, German citizens. So these interactions in the parliament show that the discursive template of Germany not being a country of immigration was invoked over and over again to reinforce uh, the previous notion of Germans. And 1982 to 1998 is also a very fascinating period for theoretical purposes because you have Christian Democrats coming back to government under Helmut Kohl and as I said in my opening slide, one of the two domestic policy goals and promises in the election campaign of Helmut Kohl is to cut, the, to reduce the number of uh, foreigners, foreigners by half. So to that end, he passes the Rutger Bereitschaft package, as I mentioned, 10,500 German marks for any foreign worker who permanently leaves Germany. And that actually uh, succeeds uh, in sending away about 350,000 Turks alone. Our neighbor from across the street was one of them when I was growing up in the early 1980s. It's say, oh yeah, oh, mind you, they came back from Germany because they, you know, they, the German government paid uh, and about 350,000 Turks went back to Turkey uh, as a result of the Rutger Bereitschaft package. That's not half of the immigrants or even half of the Turks, but it's, you know, it stopped the rise in the number of foreigners. So it, the percentage and the absolute numbers kind of stopped for the time being in the 1980s. Whereas at the same time, intake of ethnic German continues and even accelerates with the end of the Cold War and collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, again, uh, for those of you who are into Soviet uh, and post-Soviet politics, Kazakhstan had over one million ethnic Germans that Stalin deported, one million. About 90, 95% of them moved to Germany and got German citizenship uh, since the collapse of communism. So, uh, and another two million from, um, you know, other uh, formerly communist states at least. So at the same time that you have, you know, uh, intake of ethnic Germans, uh, uh, the effort to uh, remove non-Germans. And, you know, there are many, I won't go into details, I mean, there are many quotes uh, from both representatives of Berlin, which is a more kind of cosmopolitan city, right? Uh, and from other representatives, maybe more interesting for this audience is there was also a manifesto of academics, the Heidelberg Manifesto of 1982. I have the list of, I mean, it's public, they put it in, um, I don't know if it was Süddeutsche Zeitung or maybe a more 
let's not like Frankfurt or Rundschau, but it's in the book. More than a dozen professors signed a manifesto saying that, you know, the Germanness of our cities is disappearing, there are many foreigners, we need to do something for viable German families to have, you know, more children and so on and so forth. So I especially mentioned that as well in a few pages to show that academia is usually conservative, right? So like much of the bureaucracy, if military matters in the country, military, judiciary. So it's not just political opposition, it's the unelected components of government, the state, and it's um, kind of, and we see this in the Turkish case and the Russian case as well, definitely in all cases. So trying to change the definition of nationhood runs into uh, uh, obstacle with many non-political actors as well. And in 1991, the government's uh, Icelandic draft the Commissioner of Foreigners, Lizeta Funke, she resigns in a protest, and I translated the protest letter as well. She says, I can't do my job, I mean. My job is to be the Commissioner of Foreigners and make life easier or solve the problem, but with these kinds of policies that we are pursuing as the Christian Democrat liberal government, I can't really make any progress. And it's also telling that the Icelandic draft track the Commission of Foreign Affairs in the uh, CDU FDP government is always held by uh, the FDP, the smaller liberal party. Uh, the, the, so the member of the cabinet for foreigners is always from the Liberal Party, not from the Christian Democratic majority uh, in the coalition government. But 1980s is uh, very important, and I'm going to try to wrap up, wrap it up very quickly, because this is the period when in opposition in the Social Democratic and New Green Party in the opposition, and also in civil society, you start seeing the gestation, incubation, growth of new discourses on ethnicity and German nationality. I give many examples. For example, there's the Initiative Kreis Gleichberechtigung and Integration, founded in 1918 in Berlin, mostly by Turkish immigrants, and they issue a pamphlet saying foreigners' views on foreigners' policy in Turkish and German. So they are trying to make the point that we want to have a verse in how the foreign policy is designed because it's about us. In 1986, Hakka uh, Keskin, who was later uh, elected to the Bundestag, uh, he was SPD earlier, then he moved to the Linke, far left, when he got elected. Uh, in 1986, he establishes the Bündnis Türkische Einwanderer, the Union of Turkish Immigrants in Hamburg. And it's a deliberate act He's told me, it's one of my interviews, to call the association immigrants, Einwanderers. So, so their fight was a terminological one. We are not Gastarbeiter, guest worker, or Auslander, foreigner, we are Einwanderers, we are immigrants, about, with the prospect of citizenship. So uh, this definitional struggle, are you going to call them guest workers, foreigners, or Einwanderers, immigrants, was very much part of the creation of the new discourse. So the, the workers, they were trying to define themselves as islanders, as immigrants and prospective citizens. And in 1986, a major victory was won by the labor unions and the foreign, foreign workers activists in the labor union. When they gave the Deutsche Gewerkschaft, one of the largest you know, umbrella labor union in Germany, passed a resolution that says Germany is a country of immigration. That was deliberately in direct opposition to Bundländer Commission's slogan, Deutschland is kein Einwanderungsland, the German Labour Union, 10 years later in 1986, passed the resolution saying Germany is a country of immigration, and we have to start, you know, naturalizing them. I won't talk about unification, but uh, you can see in the uh, book that the three years after unification of Germany is actually when the xenophobic attacks skyrocketed. Mölln, uh, Zollingen, Rostock, many others, you know, uh, both African asylum seekers uh, and uh, particularly Turkish uh, workers' families, several houses were uh, um, yeah, burned, uh, and uh, many immigrants and asylum, not, I mean, you know, some dozens immigrants of asylum seekers uh, altogether uh, were killed in these attacks. But this also provoked a left and liberal movement for equality and citizenship. So all of this dynamic actually provoked the movement for a supra-ethnic, more inclusive German identity, such as the manifesto of the 60s uh, by left liberal academics who established the Rat for Migration, the Council for Migration, who 
are basically positioned at the opposite end of Heidelberg Manifesto almost 10 years later, who argued that we must pass a new citizenship and immigration law to open up German citizenship to immigrants. Okay, I really need to go faster, right? Greens are critical here. Green Party enters the German parliament for the first time in 1982, and Joschka Fischer, much more liberal and leftist at that time, I should say, than he became 10, 20, 30 years later in life, right? Now, in 1984, I translated the, you know, one page of uh, his speech in October 5th, 1984, in the Bundestag, he says, our former's law is in its content tied up with the legacy of the Brown dictatorship, with national socialism. He says, in the former's policy of Germany, one encounters an actual piece of apartheid South Africa in the Federal Republic. This is 1984. These are, you know, taboo-breaking, you know, sentences, right? I mean, the other members of the parliament are shouting, you are sowing hate, you are a disgrace, you should be ashamed of yourself, etc. But this is what we call breaking the ice, right? I mean, by associating Federal Republic with apartheid South Africa, former law with National Socialist Dictatorship, he kind of broke that discursive hegemony in the Bundestag of saying, you know, Germany is not a country of immigration, we are not going to discuss citizenship in this platform. It started being discussed by the Greens and later Social Democrats. Now, fast forward, there are differences which become consequential between the Social Democratic and the Green vision, right? Because Joschka Fischer in this speech and other Greens later say, we Greens want a multicultural society, we want minorities and minority protections for their own sake. He says, you know, we want this kind of diversity as a break against any conformist pressures and authoritarianism and totalitarianism in the future. So we want minority protection and legislation for its own sake. We want to institutionalize diversity. This is not what happens, right? What happens is the social democratic vision, which is more assimilationist. It's not monoethnic, but it's also not multi-ethnic. Social Democrats emphasize immigrant workers as future nationals. They favor limited second and third generation citizenship, and they are against double citizenship, this is very important, and their attitude towards asylum seekers is not entirely positive because they join Christian Democrats and uh, FDP to amend the German constitution to very much restrict the right of asylum. Germany had the most liberal asylum law in Europe as a compensation for national socialism in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, but with the asylum compromise that was very much restricted because up to Two million asylum seekers came in three years, uh, right after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and that kind of provoked this kind of new compromise on asylum. Whereas Greens opposed the asylum compromise, right? They wanted to keep uh, the most liberal asylum policy in Europe, and they wanted double citizenship, and they wanted the institutionalization of uh, diversity. So this actually explains the curious trajectory of reform. The first draft. Um, there's the historic victory of uh, Social Democrats and Greens in the 1998 elections, which even they weren't expecting, it, uh, it seems, uh, from my interviews, that they would have a kind of majority government between the two of them. Uh, and one of the first things, maybe even the first major law they propose is a new citizenship law, which allows for double citizenship and all of these things, close to the Green vision. This provoked a signature campaign in the state of Hessen by Roland Koch, a Christian democratic politician, against the, citizen, the new citizenship law. Uh, and very unexpectedly, uh, the SPD Green government lost the state of Hessen to Christian Democrats, which tipped the balance in the upper house, Bundesrat, against the government. Why is this important? Because this means they lost political hegemony. They had a very large majority in the uh, Bundestag and they had a majority in the Bundestag. Now with the Hessen debacle, they had to compromise with the FDP, with the liberals, to have a large majority again. Which means in the second, which is why in the second draft they dropped double citizenship. They introduced only conditional naturalization for you know people who uh, the details are there. People uh, who lived uh, eight years uninterruptedly legally, and so on and so forth. Whose parents, sorry, not the people, uh, the children whose parents lived eight years uninterrupted legally, and so on and so forth. So that only allowed for a small fraction of 
especially Turkish immigrant uh, workers, to be naturalized, the majority couldn't or didn't because they couldn't give up their Turkish citizenship. As we discussed yesterday in Demir and elsewhere, the Scholz government, after now 20 years, currently is discussing a new German citizenship law that will allow for double citizenship, I heard, so I'll follow that. So it's very interesting that my presentation, which is actually very past-oriented 20 years ago, is current again after 23 years because there's a new uh, citizenship debate in Germany at present to allow for double citizenship. Anyways, so an Otto Schüli, formerly Green leader, um, SPD uh, member and minister in the cabinet, summed up the new um, compromise between the liberals, social democrats, and, the, um, and half of the Greens very well. He said, the best form of integration is assimilation. This is a direct quote for Otto Schüli. This sounds like maybe exclusionary, but it isn't, right? For the for the previous status quo where even if you assimilate, you couldn't be a citizen. This was a major change. It meant that the door of assimilation, inclusion through assimilation, is now wide open for anyone who would uh, get rid of their alternative citizenships and just you know, subscribe to German citizenship and follow this path. Uh, the naturalization uh, was open. And the Rita Sussman's commission, uh, I also refer to that, uh, published a report on immigration. She is a liberal member of the Christian Democrats and a member of the parliament, um, chair, chairwoman of the uh, Bundestag for a while. Uh, for example, in that report, it's explicitly referred to, um, you know, the immigrants are explicitly referred as a potential solution for the demographic deficit in Germany. Right? So, a solution that could have been implemented even back in 1977 was now implemented or referred to almost 30 years later when the discourse and the political configuration changed. This is the summary. I mean, I know that this has been very detailed, but I can tell you that Germany was my first case and the one where the theory was developed at the most detail. So the Russian and Turkey cases are more applications of, of the model. So you have different decades of German history where you didn't have a country elite in power, or you had a country elite in power like Social Democrats from 69 to 82, but you didn't have a discourse of political hegemony. It's only in 1998 to 2005 that you have uh, parties linked with immigrants with several immigrant origin members of the parliament, right, both from the Greens and the Social Democrats. There were some foreigners who through their German mother or some other exceptional clauses got citizenship and got elected into the parliament for the first time. They came to power and then they had a major, so, and this is where you can see the voting results. It's not razor sharp, right? It's not 51%. Look at the voting records. It, it's two thirds. 365 members voted in favor of citizenship reform, 182 voted against. It's exactly two to one ratio. And when you look at the party breakdown, SPD and Greens, FDP and PDS, the Party of Democratic Socialism, which later merges and establishes the current left party, Linke, they all endorsed the proposal. Their membership together is 424 members of the parliament. CDU is the only party that opposed the proposal, 245, and every member who voted different from their party voted for a more liberal or leftist position. Like half of the Greens still voted against the proposal because they thought it's not, it's not liberal enough because it doesn't give double citizenship, it doesn't uh, allow for, you know, you know easy uh, uh, naturalization and similar with the PDS. Many uh, PDS members voted against because they thought it's too restrictive, it's too assimilation actually, which is true. But this is the new hegemony, two thirds rallied around the new uh, regime. So now I'm going to fast forward. It's a historic moment from a mono-ethnic regime to an anti-ethnic regime based on assimilation. Social Democrats, liberals, green leadership, liberal Christian uh, Democratic Union members were supporters of the new status quo. So the securitization frame shifted again, right? CSU and some CDU members were critical from a mono-ethnic right-wing position, probably now also AfD. There was no AfD, of course, at the time, alternative for Deutschland. Left party, which was at that time PDS, later Linke, and some Greens were critical from a more multi-ethnic viewpoint because they thought it was not enough. And it's this new, this kind of not enough view that is about to contribute to the new citizenship law, as, as I heard. So we are done, uh, and for every country I'm going to mention the remaining uh, exclusion or accommodation challenges. It's clear from my point of view that the securitization of ethnic difference has declined dramatically. 
but it didn't disappear. It moved towards uh, anti-ethnic regime, but securitization of conspicuous religious difference continues with Muslims. You saw in the previous uh, lecture the number of missing Muslim members of the parliament, but even more importantly, religious conservative Muslim population is pretty much not represented, right? You don't have, we go through every Muslim heritage, Muslim origin member of the parliament in every European country. In Germany, we never found a member who publicly went to the private uh, Friday prayer or fasted in Ramadan and declared or any kind of you know, mosque or religious ritual. Whereas, for example, you have them in Britain, most prominently the mayor of London, Saad Khan, openly talks about how fasting in Ramadan is very you know, challenging for him. And Scotland elected a prime minister who publicly prays as the imam of his family. But that's a very British and very kind of unique family. You have almost no such example in Germany. About the, you have no example, no such example among uh, German uh, members of the parliament from any political party that are elected, not in France and not in, so the few examples, I mentioned one or two in Belgium, maybe one in Italy, a very kind of uh, out of pattern example. But this is a remaining challenge, uh, the representation of religious conservative Muslim minorities, uh, what would be the equivalent of Hamza Yusuf of Scotland, Saad Khan of uh, London or Mahin Rosdemir uh, of uh, Belgium. Okay, fast forward. Okay, fine. Do you have any questions and comments? We have the it's kind of speed. Uh, we've reached a certain speed limit. None. Everyone is just devastated by too many slides. Okay, then we won't have, a, uh, we will go through the slides. Uh, at least the previous lectures and the framework allows you to grasp the theory much better. Uh, the difference between the Turkish model is, I mean, the Republic of Turkey established in 1923. Here you see Mustafa Kemal Atatürk with the Turkish flag with probably one of his most famous uh, sayings, which is imprinted in every primary and elementary school I saw. How happy is the one who says I'm a Turk? It summarizes the nation building uh, view quite well. Include you know, many different ethnic groups, but for purposes of assimilation, right? So Turkey from the beginning to the present day had, you know, citizenship for Kurds, Arabs, and incoming, you know, eventually millions of Bosniak, Macedonian, Torbesh, these are Bulgarian, Pomak, you know, Muslim, Slavic, and non-Slavic ethnic groups of the Balkans, Circassian, Crimean, Tatars, immigrating to Turkey, getting Turkish citizenship as are the originally Albanians or Bosniaks, but with the condition that they assimilate into Turkish language and culture. Uh, Atatürk only, I mean, the foreign language that he knew and read and uh, emulated was uh, the French. So the French Third Republic was very clearly uh, the model for Turkish Republican nation building in the 1920s. Uh, both secularist uh, and monolingual and monocultural Turkish language, a new Turkish language with a Latin alphabet, a new dress code, a new secular Republican Turkish only lifestyle to which all ethnic groups, Arab, Kurd, Laz, are expected to assimilate. Demands for ethnic expression failed throughout the 19, so until 1950, I don't discuss it similar to the, uh, to the other cases because until 1950, there was a one party authoritarian regime, no free elections, right? So, uh, it was the same Republican People's Party in power. But after 1950, you really had genuinely competitive elections where representatives of Kurds, Arabs, and others enter into the parliament. So it's more, um, uh, more intriguing why there was no ethnic uh, regime change or decriminalization of minority languages from 1950s onwards, right? Several dramatic examples. In 1970, the Labour Party of Turkey was closed down for stating that Kurds exist right, by the uh, prosecutor. In 1982, Sharaf Ettin Erci, who was a minister in the cabinet, Minister of Irrigation and then Public Works, in the 1970s, he served some time in prison for stating that there are Kurds and I am a Kurd. Right, so he, he was Kurt, obviously, and many other members of the parliament, including a cabinet member, minister like himself, was also Kurt, 
but it was publicly prescribed, prohibited to say that you are a Kurd and you speak Kurdish. And this is, of course, 1982 is a bit, because this is the junta period, right? I mean, he was a minister in the 70s under multi-party democracy, when the military coup and the three-year military dictatorship was imposed from 1980 to 83. That's when he was in prison, not during the more competitive era. Against this background, and many other examples can be, can be cited, these are the you know, high-level ministerial and national party-level examples. In 2004, the Turkish radio and television, the publicly funded state television, started broadcasting in Arabic, Bosniak, uh, Circassian, Kurdish, and Zazan for about 20 minutes, half an hour. In 2009, TRT established an entire TV channel that only broadcasts in Kurdish seven days a week and, you know, around the clock. And in 2011, Kurdish and the other minority languages, Zaza, uh, Circassian, Bosniak, were introduced as optional elective language courses in, in uh, middle schools and high schools. Uh, Kurdish is the most popular one. I don't mention the others, but it's actually a package of five, six, eventually seven languages. And some tens of thousands eventually elected this. In 2013, the Turkish oath of allegiance was removed from school. So when I was in school in 1980s, in elementary school, for example, every morning we would, every morning we would read out the pledge of allegiance, oath of allegiance that says, "I'm a Turk. I'm hardworking. I'm trustworthy," and it ends with, "How happy is the one who says I'm a Turk?" So it's kind of Atatürk's um, saying uh, in, in an entire paragraph. So as you can imagine, uh, this oath of allegiance or pledge to Turkishness every morning for people who are not ethnically Turkish or who don't feel and who don't want to feel uh, Turkish was a major grievance. But, you know, it was a major, um, again, development to remove it from basically all, all schools, primary and elementary. Uh, of course, we are going to talk about the two sides of the coin later, but this these are the major transformations that I focus on. Why and how such a dramatic transformation happened? And what kind of securitizations did it remove? Which new securitizations it uh, engendered, which you can find in the final article assigned. So these popular explanations are just chronologically doesn't fit. European Union was not even in the agenda of Turkey by 2009, let alone 2011, 2013. So it's not EU pressure at all. If it was EU pressure, it should have been in the 1990s or maybe 2001. Uh, PKK was most active in 1992, 93, 94. By 1999, Abdullah Jalan was captured and imprisoned. So you know, it's, in a way, it's the weakest point of PKK, 2000, uh, 2000 2001, 2002, when the, uh, when the reforms were passed, and in fact, politically, uh, parties politically affiliated or close to PKK will protest many of the reforms, and they won't vote in favor, and, or at least they will abstain. So why did it happen then? I'm going to fast forward. We don't have time for this. You can, uh, you have all the articles. So 1950 is when you have, I mean, of course, 1923, 1950 is very important because it's a period of, uh, unending military rule and state of emergency in eastern uh, provinces, uh, military operations, rebellions, etc. But it's an authoritarian one-party period, so it's impossible to think about a counter-elite link with Kurds or any other minorities in the parliament or the cabinet at the time. In 1950, you have the first free and fair elections and Democratic Party wins the elections in a landslide. So a majority of the Kurds by any account provincial or kind of more local accounts voted for the Democratic Party, which is center-right in Turkish politics. So as opposed to the party that established the Republic, Republican People's Party, more secular Kemalists, so Kurds and many other minorities went for the center-right party, which was also more liberal. In a way, kind of voting against uh, the Republican Kemalist option. However, there was absolutely no legal institutional changes regarding Kurdish or other languages or cultural expressions in the 50s. It's similar to the social democratic government in, uh, in Germany period. Uh, because the democratic party leadership ideologically also subscribed to the notion that Turkishness is something you get through assimilation that it's not ethnically specific, Kurd or Zaza and Laz, everyone can just claim that they are Turkish and just speak the standard official Turkish language with Latin alphabet and the new dress code. 
and you become secular Republican New Turks. So they didn't have an alternative conception of multi-ethnic Turkishness with multiple official languages or different lifestyles and so on and so forth. Here, I guess, an emblem would be the Democrat president, Jamal Bayar, uh, Jalal Bayar, who said, worshiping at the, uh, uh, loving Atatürk is a kind of worship, so in a, in a positive way. So even the Democratic president was quite Kemalist uh, and Unionist before that in his conception of uh, uh, Turkish identity. Prime Minister, not so much, the one who is eventually executed with the military coup in 1960, Menderes. But still, Kurds, and in the initial election in 1950, at least what, that's what all my uh, Alevi interviewers said, Alevis and non-Muslims, Armenian Jews and uh, Greeks who had some population, very small but uh, still uh, representatives, they voted for Democrats. What can a counter elite without a uh, new discourse do uh, when it's in government? We see, we saw it in the 1950s when uh, the democratic government, for example, put a general in trial for uh, extrajudicially executing 33 Kurds for smuggling in 1943 during the one party rule. So this is quite unprecedented, right, to put a Turkish general in trial, finding him guilty, put them in detention and uh, detention in prison in 1951-52. This happened through the initiative of democratic members of uh, the parliament, particularly of Kurdish origin, but not only Kurdish origin. And there were more services, you know, infrastructure, roads, hospitals to the Kurdish majority areas, but no new discourse and no citizenship change. I'm going to fast forward all the other slides. 1960-1990 is a different electoral system, proportional representation with no threshold. So this is a period when we see many different small parties, 3%, 5%, 1%, some of which almost exclusively rely on ethnic voting. So ethnic parties constitutionally forbidden, but these were de facto ethnic parties. And I give several examples in my uh, article. Uh, some ethnic parties were Despite being ethnic minority parties, Kemalist and you know pro assimilation, pro Kemalism, and I, I give one example of that. Uh, but two other new discourses emerged in this period that were against assimilation. One is the socialists, and I'll focus on them. And then the second one, which becomes much much larger and eventually almost hegemonic, Islamists. So those were the two ideological currents that I observe already in the early 70s and 60s emerging with a kind of um, explicit opposition to assimilation and in favor of legislating uh, non-Turkish, you know, allowing non-Turkish languages and cultures from being expressed. Fast forward, so none of these ethnic parties came to power. For example, we have a unique case, which never happened again, of an ethno-religious party, uh, Turkey's Unity Party, Turkey Birlik Partisi, that relied on Alevi votes and uh, all eight members of the parliament were Alevi that were elected and four or five of them directly claimed descendants from Hacı Bektaş, um, the historical spiritual leader, or at least one of the leaders, uh, a prominent one of uh, Anatolian Alevi, uh, whose last names are Ulusoy. Um, and what you see is a clear pattern where uh, the party only got 2.8% of the vote in Turkey in general, but it got 23% of the vote in Amasya or 17% of the vote in Tokat and Chorum. These were, not so much today, but in the 1960s and 70s, were provinces with um, the highest concentration of uh, Alevi uh, populations and electorates. But Turkey's unity party was absolutely, you know, Kemalist and secularist in its ideology. Its founder was a former colonel or general from the military. Uh, and they were probably the most Kemalist in the spectrum. So they didn't advocate any kind of ethnic or sectarian accommodations or recognition. I mention this because this is one path. There were some who actually had this kind of uh, party or organization. New Turkey Party is also like that. Very much Kurdish voters and electorate and elected, but very much following the official uh, discourse on Turkish national identity. More interesting for our purposes are, of course, the two party traditions that were openly against assimilation. Turkey's Labour Party, socialist, 
they came up with a new alternative discourse, class struggle and class identity as the new uh, common denominator. They explicitly refer to Kurds, Armenians, and others in their radio broadcasts and election campaigns. And this is a discourse we are familiar from international socialism. You know, Druzhba Narodov, uh, Brotherhood of Nations, was translated in Turkish, Hatler and Kardeshli, Kurdish, Bratia Gelan, right? So all of the Soviet and non-Soviet socialist slogans and discourse about brotherhood of peoples and nations and ethnicities uh, in Turkish. Uh, so I guess here the aspiration was some kind of socialist and socialistic revolutionary federation of peoples, right? But this is kind of the peak 3% of the world in Turkey, but 8% in Diyarbakir, a major Kurdish city, as you might know, 6% in Kars. And in Tunjeli, uh, the Socialist Party reached 17%, almost eight times its, or five times its uh, national average in the 1969 elections, but never became a member of any coalition government and remained in that range and then disappeared after peaking at 3%. Islamism proved to be much more popular, and the Islamist discourse was also multi-ethnic, but with a completely different justification, and that, of course, explains the new waves of securitization later. Uh, National Salvation Party, MSP, came up, uh, was you know, one of the carriers of this, uh, politically the highest carrier of this discourse in the 1970s, and they argued that religion, Islam, is the common denominator of uh, all citizens, so Kurds, Arabs, and Turks should be able to you know, express their uh, languages and ethnicities and cultures because it's the common belief faith that holds us together. And this is very much explained also in my article, One Nation Under Allah. And when we look, even in 1970s, this is 1977 elections, that's almost 50 years ago. Even though National Salvation Party got 8% of the vote in the country as a whole, it got 19% in Diyarbakir, 22% in Bitlis, similarly Kurdish majority, 23% in Adiyaman, also Kurdish majority. So Islamist party always outperformed in the Kurdish provinces by two to three, sometimes four times its national average. So what we see here, and I'm going to fast forward, is that the socialist movement and the Islamist movement from their moment of origins overperformed among you know, Kurds and some other non-Turks than they did in the West and Central. And this is, and this is very much understandable for my theory because they promised uh, ethno-linguistic recognition. The deep impact of the 1980 military coup, which criminalized many um, you know, uh, uh, ethnic and um, other identity movements, you have two periods, 1990 to 95, when social democratic populist parties in government for four years as the second you know, large coalition partner, and it did promise in its elections to legal, legalize Kurdish language, recognize Alevis, establish a Kurdish institute. Social Democrats could not deliver any of these promises. And my explanation is that because they only had about a fifth or quarter of the parliament, and they were the junior partner of the coalition. The larger partner of the coalition was center-right, and the rest of the parliament uh, was also opposed. Similarly, there was only a one-year-long Islamist coalition government welfare party under Erbakan in 96-97. Even though Islamists also overperformed and overrepresented among Kurds, they didn't and um, couldn't pass any legislation on this at this time because they also controlled only about a fifth of the parliament and were a coalition government. You see, again, we fast forward to 1987, Islamist party, 7% of the vote uh, in the country as a whole, but 22% in Bengal or 17% in Adiyaman. So this is, I mean, this is all, you know, discourse analysis. There are many, many speeches of both Erbakan, the former Islamist leader from 1960s until 1990s, uh, when uh, current president and before that party leader Erdogan uh, became the leader of the uh, Islamic, uh, the largest Islamic origin, Islamist origin party. Their speeches are very similar from the 60s, from the 70s, especially 80s, to the present, uh, in the Kurdish provinces, that it's Islam that matters, not ethnicity or nationality. Kurd and Arab and Turk are equivalent, uh, and we should emphasize religious identity and not ethno-national distinctiveness. Uh, okay, I'm just going to, I think the, so these are all voting results, but I, I hope I convinced you that they outperform uh, in, in these elections. Okay. What is the purpose of a discourse? 
new discourse, whether it's in Germany, Russia, or Turkey. The purpose of the new discourse is obviously not to convince the ethnic or linguistic minorities. They are already convinced that reform should happen, right? But new discourse is absolutely critical to convince the majority, right? Majority of Turks, majority of Germans, majority of Ruski Russians for reform. Right? Because otherwise, you can't pass a reform that primarily benefits, let's say, 17% of the population that self identifies as Kurdish or 8 9% of the president population that identifies as foreign or guest worker. What you need to do is to convince the 50 plus percent of the majority ethnic or linguistic group that this reform is beneficial for Germany, Turkey, Russia as a whole. And that's exactly where, for example, in this case, Islamism comes into play, which the other right-wing or left-wing parties didn't have a discourse that, con that could convince almost 50% and plus of the population that this is the right thing to do to pass these reforms, which I mentioned, these are the reforms, Kurdish language broadcasting, 2004, it really jumps in 2009, education and removal of the Turkish uh, of allegiance, and then there are also some non-Muslim openings. The first church built since the beginning of the Republic, a couple of years ago, first Holocaust commemoration, first uh, rebuilding of synagogues and condolences for 1915, and so on and so forth. But this goes, and this is very much linked to the article on One Nation Under Allah. This is entirely within an Islamic religious and multicultural framework, right? It goes hand in hand with first woman with headscarf entering into the Turkish parliament in 2013, the same year out of allegiance is removed. The first uh, woman with headscarves in the judiciary, bureaucracy, police, military, a new civil law that allows for public servants to have beards. They couldn't have beards before because you had to shave. It was seen as Islamic religious symbol to have beards uh, for public servants. All these kinds of reforms that allowed for conservative religious visibility went hand in hand with uh, removing prohibitions on Kurdish, Arabic, and other. And this very much explains why, on the one hand, the government was able to get, you know, some of the Kurdish vote, uh, okay, this is the explanation. Uh, th this uh, explains the paradox why Kurdish opening was embraced by maybe a third or half of the Kurds, but opposed by the other half. Alevi opening was opposed by most of the Alevis, but accepted by, embraced maybe by, by a very small uh, minority. Because religion, Islam in this case, does not only unite, it also divides and polarizes national politics. So just as it desecuritizes, especially religious conservative, Kurdish, Arab, Laz, Circassian identity, it securitizes, for example, militantly atheist or very socialist uh, Kurdish, Laz, Laz identity, right? So it actually, this is why, you know, so desecuritization is moved to a different dimension of politics. Right, so, uh, okay, yeah. So, for example, the debates around secularism and especially Alevi identity as a non-mainstream within Turkey, religious identity increase just as, you know, these reforms are at the same time happening. And of course, there are constitutional limits such as Turkey being secular, both in the constitution and in the entire legal system. Which brings me, okay, so I already mentioned all of this. I really have to, do I have any time? Okay, let's eat them. Yeah. yeah, and this very much relates to the transition from Kurdish question to the Syrian Arab question in Turkey today. Turkey is three and a half, by some accounts, four million Syrian refugees, almost all Arab. The largest, the country with the largest number of Syrian Arab refugees in the world. Uh, and they've been in Turkey for over 10 years. And Again, we see the same religious conservative, secular national opposition now around the treatment of Syrian Arab refugees. Interestingly enough, but not interesting if you keep in mind the ideological background, uh, the secularist and secular nationalist opposition is more in favor of sending away all Syrians within two years. That was an election campaign of the opposition presidential candidate two week, uh, a month ago, whereas the government is still more Islamic religious conservative government, is still more keen on keeping Syrian Arabs with uh, the 
option, which the president mentioned several times, of neutralizing them. Because, again, just like any identity conflict, it is perceived through the religious-secular divide more than anything else. We don't have questions because I really want to say something about Russia. I wish I started with Russia. Now I, I regret it. Because we have more readings on Russia than any, any other. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Do you have any burning emergency questions? No. Everyone wants to just get it over. Yeah, I'll be there for, you know, open office hours uh, on the table. Okay, so I mean, Soviet Union is, is, of course, maybe the most fascinating case because, again, this is kind of only slightly controversial, but it was the first modern state that went to greatest lengths in institutionalizing ethnic and linguistic diversity. 15 Union Republics, 15 official languages, Moldovan, you know, Kazakh, Uzbek, all the slogans, all the propaganda in 15 languages. The idea that communism has to propagate it in every language, and this is a model for the rest of the world as world socialist revolution. This is, there is, I don't know any other modern state that did this before 1922. And we see its diffusion to other Marxist Leninist states. They are totalitarian, no doubt about it, right? So it, has, it is national in form and absolutely socialist Marxist Leninist in content. So, I mean, yes, it's in Armenian, it's in Uzbek, it's in Azerbaijani, but it's the party line that is in Azerbaijani, Armenian, and Kazakh. And there is, you know, pretty much no tolerance for any other ideological worldview, et cetera, you know the gulag, the great terror, millions of people exiled and killed, all of this is very well known for any Soviet historian, right? But at the same time, this is a model of multi-ethnicity and multilingual statehood that the world has never seen in modern times. And it diffused from Soviet Union to other socialist regimes, such as Yugoslavia, People's Republic of China, even, you know, small Czechoslovakia, but even local applications of it, such as Turkish folk in East Germany, some applications in Southeast Asia, and, and so on and so forth. So this is, you know, 50 years before Kimlika, or liberal, you know, Canadian multiculturalism, I always get into a little bit of debate sometimes. The first modern state that implemented and radiated or diffused this model is the Soviets, whether we like it or not. It's totally, the two, that's why I say all good things do not go together. Many people think, okay, 15 official languages this is a great thing, you know, uh, institutionalization of ethnicity, but it went together with a totalitarian dictatorship. So there is no correlation between liberal democracy, in fact, to a certain extent, even the opposite, as I uh, indicated earlier uh, with this. And I just want to say that since Stalin imposed every Soviet citizen's about the age of 16, to have his or her ethnicity, nationalnost, in the fifth line of their identification document in 1934. This has been an issue throughout Khrushchev, Brezhnev, Gorbachev periods to Yeltsin. In every period, they tried to remove ethnicity from the passport. Those who thought it would be better to have one Soviet Skinarod, a Soviet nation, and no more Armenians, Azerbaijanis, you know, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Ukrainians, because they increasingly saw also a liability in this. And in every attempt, they failed. And that's what the book actually documents. Khrushchev attempted it, he failed. Brezhnev attempted it, he failed. Gorbachev attempted it, and he also failed. And in each case, it was the Union Republics and their leadership, Kazakh and Latvia and Azerbaijan, who opposed this movement towards removal of ethnicity from internal passports because they understood very well that their privileges, their territorial autonomy, their titular status all depended on codification and recording of ethnicity in everyone's ID cards, in the census. The entire system was built on citizenry being divided to 61 ethnic groups, 15 of them with union republics and dozens of them with autonomous republics. So this Soviet model of flourishing, Rasvet, followed by Sibylizhenia coming together and Siliania merger, melting into one big Soviet nation, it never materialized. The Siliania stage never happened, even though Khrushchev came up with the definition of Soviet Skinarod, as I document in the 1961 Party Congress. He says, a Moraya Storichiski Optionals today, a new historical community of people that the world has never seen before. Soviets have all these futuristic discourses. 
It's like space, Gagarin, Sputnik, you know, Soviet society is something that human evolution has never seen before. It's the next stage in human. This is the, so this is the socialist promise, right? Soviet land is basically the most advanced form of humanity, human evolution in the world. As soon as, you know, it became clear eventually, both domestically and definitely internationally, that this isn't working, of course, that's going to dissolve. But more interesting is the fact that they removed class origins. Class origin was also written until 1970s, you know, peasant, worker, intelligentsia. They removed class origin, but they couldn't remove ethnicity. So in a, in a kind of ironic way, the socialist state finally got away from any class distinction between peasant and worker, but it could not remove ethnicity, which it codified for the first time, right? I mean, before the Soviets counted, there were no counting of Mordvins and Chukchis. Yes, this proposal came up and defeated even in 1991 when Central Asian deputies, Beishkara, for example, a Kyrgyz deputy, said removing ethnicity from the passport would be genocide against the Kyrgyz people. Right, you shouldn't remove it. But it's more paradoxical or ironic that even after Soviet Union collapsed into 50, you know, dissolved into 15 republics, even within the Russian Federation, there was resistance to removal of ethnicity from the passport, in part because there are still 21 ethnic republics within the Union. This is the map and the composition of the ethnic republics. And when a new discourse came with Yatsin and his Minister of Nationality, Stishko, that we should no longer talk about Ruski, ethnic Russians, who are 78% of the Federation, but Rossiani, inhabitants of Russia. That was the new discourse. Valery Tushko is still alive, has been the professor and head of Institute of Ethnology and Anthropology in Moscow. I interviewed him, of course, for the dissertation and the book. He developed, articulated this notion as the Minister of Nationalities in the first Yeltsin government that Russia needs a new civic territorial nationhood. Get rid of ethnic distinction, just call everyone Russian, inhabitants of Russia, no more Tatar, no more Bashkir, no more Ruski. And in 1997, at the height of Yeltsin's power, after he won the second presidential election, and the opposition is completely in disarray, Yeltsin removed ethnicity from all identification documents with an executive decree, which is debatable constitutionally because it needs, according to some, a constitutional amendment. But it's Yatsin's, you know, autocratic power, right? He uh, signed an executive degree and it was removed. But it was protested by Tatars and Bashkirs and English and even some Jews because Jews and Germans were the two ethnic groups that had the most grievances against having ethnicity in the passport because both Jews and especially you know, ethnic Germans were severely discriminated because of having their German and Jewish identity in the passports because especially Germans were seen as a kind of enemy ethnicity. They were deported en masse to Kazakhstan, probably the most mistreated, one of the top two, three most treat, uh, mistreated uh, ethnic uh, uh, groups in the Soviet Union. So they actually, uh, both in the Brezhnev period, especially, but also in the later periods, they were among the leading ethnic groups, the German and Jewish group, for the removal of ethnicity from the passport to get rid of this discrimination. Uh, Tatars, for example, they burned the Russian passport in the major square in Tatarstan. You can't do that now, but in the 1990s, I guess you could. Right? They inserted a separate page saying, you know, this person is Tatar or Bashkir or Ruski, an additional page. But in the, Bashkirs took it to the constitutional court, said this needs a constitutional amendment. President can't unilaterally change it with an executive order. But all of this has failed. And since that time, ethnicity, nationality no longer appears in the Russian identification documents. Yatsin signed an even another decree which shows that it's a kind of deliberate policy to remove it from birth certificates so that it can't be recorded at the time of the birth either. So all of this is to say that I made this argument even in the, you know, Putin was a newbie at that time, right, 2004, 2007, that Russia is on track towards a very assimilationist nation building model, even though its history, especially in the Soviet period, is one of very high level of multi-ethnic institutionalization. And by now, we see its results already. This is the table from one of the articles assigned. 
the Journal of Ethnic and Migration uh, Studies article, Transforming the Nation Through Migration in Russia, I tabulated the 10 largest non-Russian ethnic groups in the Russian Federation, Bashkir, Buryat, Chechen, Chuvash, Ingush, Marial, Mordvin, Tatar, Udmurt, and Yakut, and look at their level of Russian versus titular, their own language, Bashkir, Tatar, language competence in 1989 versus today. There's a dramatic change. Just to give some example, in 1989, 72% of Buryats spoke Russian, now it's 96%. More importantly, in 1989, 79% of Buryats spoke their titular language, now it's 44 so in 15 years, the, the, the far right column shows the loss of titular language in just 30 years. It declined by a third among Buryats. One out of three Buryat no longer speaks uh, the Buryat language. It's actually a minority among Buryats. Only less than half of Buryats can speak their own language. 28% decline in English, 18% in Mordvin, and so on and so forth. The only ethnic group that's an exception unsurprisingly, is Chechen, because Chechens are de facto living in a different world, governed by a different, you know, Kadir and the clan, and they experienced genuine independence for three years under uh, Aslan Mashadal uh, after the Hassan Yurt Accord in 1996-99. So only Chechens still retain almost 100% Chechen language competence. All the other nine major ethnic groups speak much more Russian than their titular language. And this happened in the last 30 years. I mean, a major, major change by any measure. There are many other, uh, I mean, you can read the article that we wrote with Sufyan on Circassian languages. Circassian languages are constitutionally co-equal languages in Adigay Republic, Kabardina, Balkaria, um, and two other North Caucasian republics. But as it is documented in that article, you can't really have Circassian language higher education. It's debatable that you can even have you know, Circassian language you know, high school in many places. So it's really left to the individuals and institutions, civic kind of effort to keep Adigay, Kabardin, and other you know, Western and Eastern Circassian languages survive. But Compared to the Muscovite state and Russian state supporting Russian as the other language, I mean, of course, it's not an equal playing field, right? So uh, I think uh, he, my co-author, might be the last person who wrote a thesis in the Circassian language, no, not in Russian, but in Circassian. It's not possible in the Russian uh, higher education anymore. Again, even though this is the constitutional co-equal language of four republics, this is how uh, far uh, assimilation went through. And Constitution Court banned the use of non-Cyrillic alphabets for the titular republics. When I visited Tatarstan in 2004, Kazan, and I speak some Russian, understand? So there was Russian in Cyrillic, and then Tatar, Turkic, in Latin. And that was very impressive for me, because you know I can, as a native Turkish speaker, I can make sense of the Tatar, Turkic language written in Latin alphabet as well. It has been forbidden. So you can't write Buryat or Chechen or Tatar or any other otherwise on paper constitutionally co-equal language in an alphabet other than Cyrillic, in Latin or Arabic or you know, Armenian or Georgian alphabets. It's forbidden. All of this shows that Russia came a long way away from institutionalization of, in the Tsarist period, multi-confessional, in the Soviet period, multi-ethnic, multilingual nationhood, to an assimilationist melting pot with ethnic Russians and Russian orthodoxy as the first among equals ethnically and religiously. I leave you with this, um, these somewhat pessimistic but mixed conclusions that unfortunately all good things do not go together. Each ethnicity regime creates winners and losers. That's why in a way my example of most multi-ethnic regimes is also the most totalitarian and authoritarian one, Soviet and later Russian which goes to show that actually it's not always Canada and India, or you know, India isn't that, you know, Canada or Belgium, you know, you have very multi-ethnic, multilingual states that are otherwise extremely uh, undemocratic. Each ethnicity regime creates winners and losers, while the opponents of the status quo are securitized earlier. Once the reform happens and ethnic regime changes, 
the supporters of the previous ethnic regime may be securitized. But I want to conclude with something we didn't assign in a post-Marxist, post-socialist, and post-liberal world. Nationalisms and religions are most likely to be the two major cosmologies competing in the marketplace of identities. That's from uh, nationalism and religion in comparative perspective. And that's probably why conflict and securitization is still likely along these dimensions uh, in all three ethnicity regimes, but based on different policies of membership and expression. Thank you very much, and sorry for uh, eating uh, 12 minutes of your lunch time. Thank you.